Welcome to Fossil's Molecular Machines Group. Really, really happy to see so many of you here. Extremely excited uh, to finally have Peter Salk on. He was nominated by many of you, so thanks for that. Um, that's a quick reminder on my end also to continue nominating people that you really want to hear from. You can self-nominate. <laughs> I'll share the nomination form here in the chat again. Um, but for now, I'm super happy to have you here. Um, I was very saddened, but we didn't get uh, to meet in person at our Designing Molecular Machines uh, workshop, of which the report and videos uh, are now out, and I will share them with the group uh, after this. But for now, I'm really happy that it worked out, that uh, we get to hear from you virtually. People are extremely excited about your work in this group already. And, um, you know, I'm sure that we have some interesting discussion also afterwards after your presentation. But for now, I'm uh, really happy to have you here um, to discuss computer-aided design and modeling for nuclear acid nanotechnology. I've already had a little peek on your slides. They look really wonderful. And I'll be in the chat um, helping, uh, you know, uh, guide a bit the conversation. And uh, for everyone here, usually at the end, it gets quite crowded in terms of Q&A. Uh, so if you want to make sure that your question gets uh, answered, feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, and otherwise, uh, feel free to raise hand after uh, Peter's presentation. So thanks a lot for joining. Uh, it's a uh, true honor to have you here. Really excited for the Q&A. And um, yeah, excited for your presentation. Oh, thank you, Alison, so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to this audience. So I can share my screen again. Uh, all right. So what I want to talk about is about using computer modeling for insights into biotechnology with particular focus on nucleic acid nanotechnology. It might not be necessary for this audience, but I always want to start with the slides to explain what we mean by self-assembly. So if you think about assembling things, most people would think about what I call a top-down approach, where you put a particle piece into a particle location where it should be placed, such as when you're assembling chair from IKEA. However, this is not how nature does things. Nature self-assembles things. And if you would think about self-assembling chair, there is a beautiful video by a team from MIT, which actually designed a chair from plastic and magnetic pieces and to modulate the random fluctuations which are present in water. They basically have a little aquarium in which they have water flow. And after dozens of minutes in the video, which is sped up by a large factor, you see that the pieces of the chair are actually designed to self-assemble into a target shape. This is actually not so easy, even though it might seem so at the first look, to actually design pieces in such a way that they would self-assemble into a target structure. But nature does this all the time. I mean, the simple examples are viral capsids, but you can go all the way to very complex molecular machines, such as ribosome or bacterial flagella. And if we take it to another level, every one of you is actually a self-assembled complex molecular machine. But even things such as viral capsids is something which is not that easy to rationally design to self-assemble into a target shape, not to mention more complex structures like ribosome or exosome, etc. So that is one of the goals of one technology to self-assemble complex nanostructures and devices. And the field in which I work is one of the most advanced branches of nanotechnology or biomimetic nanotechnology, I should say, which is the field of DNA and RNA nanotech. Uh, the field uses designed DNA or RNA strands that self-assemble into a target shape. The reason it works so well is that we know that A will pair with T and C will pair with G, so you can really design single strands so that they assemble into a target shape just because the thing you want will maximize all the bonds for it. Now, it sounds easy when it works, but believe me, designing these structures is actually quite difficult. And we would like to have computer models that can allow you to simulate how these structures assemble and how they work. Just these days, when somebody designs a computer chip or an airplane, you can't really design an airplane without having a sophisticated model of the airflow around its wings. And we are currently not in a position in nanotech that we will be able to really simulate the long time scales and system sizes associated with the function of these systems, which is sort of my goal here. 
So this what I'm showing is not a simulation. It's a artist video from Sean Douglas's group at UCSF <clears throat> that illustrates one of the basic concepts in DNA nanotech. You have long single-stranded scaffold, and then you have shorter DNA strands called staples, where each strand is complementary to a different region on the scaffold. And by designing what strand is complementary to what region, you actually get the self-assembly structure after a while. So of course, this is an artist's impression. This is know how things happen in nature. You have seen the chaotic video of the moving chair and similar forces are at play in natural systems. Now, ideally, we would want to simulate these systems at atomistic resolution. This is what people usually think of when they talk about molecular simulations of uh, nano devices or molecules. Every single atom in the molecule is a single particle in your simulation, and you would like to simulate how these atoms move and interact. This is great, but there are a few drawbacks. One of all is that despite all the progress we've seen in the computing over the past several decades, we still cannot simulate very long timescales. So the state of the art simulations are maybe getting to tens of microseconds, maybe milliseconds, if you really push it. That's really very few groups and very few computing equipment that can do that. But the systems I'm just interested in self-assembling, DNA now technology, they have 6,000 base pairs. Their assembly takes minutes to hours. The action of these devices is milliseconds and longer. So it's really extremely difficult, very often out of reach for optimistic resolution simulation. So what we do in my group and with my collaborators, we coarse grain these systems. Coarse graining means that you replace multiple atoms by a single superatom and you design interactions between these superatoms to reproduce certain property that is crucial to describe your system correctly. There is, of course, no free lunch. So by cross-graining the system, you, of course, lose certain resolution and certain accuracy. So the art of designing these models comes with the fact that you need to know what things you are sacrificing for getting larger speed and whether the things you see in your simulation are still physical or whether what you are seeing is or the artifact of the approximations you are making. So the key thing that we want from our model for DNA and RNA is that two single strands on their own are very flexible polymers, but when they meet, they form a right-handed rigid duplex with the mechanical properties that is known to be measured for DNA molecule or RNA. We also want to get roughly the structure correctly, so the double helix has to have the right shape, the, the right periodicity. And we also want to get the mechanical properties right. So there are no experiments when people pull on DNA and then see how it reacts to certain force or to certain torque. And we can verify that our model can reproduce uh, in the, these mechanical properties. So as I said, the key property of 4D nanotech is that you have three diffusing complementary strand, but they can come together and form a perfect duplex. Now, one second of this video takes about one second to simulate on my laptop. So you see within a few seconds, we can go from separated single-stranded DNA into a perfectly formed 8 mer. Now, if you were to simulate this with full atomistic resolution, uh, it would take you on the state-of-the-art computing equipment maybe several months to see just one transition of this happening. So that gives you an idea of the several orders of magnitude speed up we obtain by cause graining. So what are the applications of our models? So with the advancement of GPU computing, we have really been able to scale up the sizes of the systems we can simulate. We started with the model about 10 years ago, and at the time we were looking at things like pulling on single strands or strand displacement reaction. That was maybe the best we could do at the time, which I will introduce in a minute. And our yet unpublished data, we are able to simulate DNA nanocrystals which can have two million nucleotides or more. And this is all thanks to the GPU computing and the advancement it brings to uh, running our models. Uh, we also have the similar model for RNA. I'm not going to go into detail in the interest of time, but it's the similar cross gaining philosophy. And it's been applied to RNA nanotechnology 
both simulating some basic biophysical properties of RNA, as well as nanotechnology constructs like RNA origamis or RNA types. So I did introduce the field of DNA and RNA nanotech. I didn't really tell you what it is good for. So some of this is really just basic research, just to show you can assemble stuff and do computing with RNA or DNA at molecular level. But there are indeed promising upcoming applications in diagnostics, therapeutics, or biotemplated materials. And I prepared a few examples of applications of our model where it can gain insight into functioning of some of these promising devices. So I showed you the video of DNA origami assembling. So you've seen the basic trick of DNA RNA technology that you have single strand, which is complementary to different regions on the long strand binds to. The second basic trick of nanotechnology is the strand displacement reaction, which on this slide I introduced for RNA, but it works basically similarly for DNA as well. This is a basic reaction for computing with molecules. Some groups like Lulu Chen and Eric Winfrey and Caltech have shown that you can compute arbitrary logic gate function by interaction between DNA or RNA strands. And there are already companies that exist that use this type of reaction to do smart therapeutics. So they can carry out logic gate function as a part of drug delivery. Like if certain molecule of RNA is present, only then you release a therapeutic agent. So for example, if mRNA with certain mutation, which is a hallmark of cancer, is present, then you release an RNA which interferes with the production of growth gene or something like that. I'm not going to go into these more complex applications. I'm just going to focus at the reaction, which is at the heart of this, which is the strand displacement. What you start with is a gate. The gate is composed of the incumbent strand, which is in green in this slide, and substrate, which is in red. At room temperature or at the temperature of your body, 36 Celsius degrees, these strands would never spontaneously dissociate. But if you introduce the blue strand, which is fully complemented to the red, it first binds to this region, which is called toe hole. And then what happens by random fluctuation, you might have this base pair break or, and the blue one jump in, it can go in both directions. So you spend in a real experiment, microsecond to milliseconds going between the state B and C until eventually the blue strand fully kicks out the green strand, which then diffuses away and can take part in some other reaction. This is how you can realize end gate or OR gates. What we are after here is the basic biophysics of this reaction. And out of all the models that exist out there, our model is really the only one which can successfully reproduce on reasonable time scale the biophysics of the strand displacement reaction. So it, this was really the moment when our model started to be adopted in the field when we showed we can simulate this reaction and our results can explain some experimental measurements. Uh, what can we do with our model? So one of the things that can be done is to assign probability to different states. So probability is related to free energy. So if you take logarithm of probability to have certain number of base pairs, what you get is minus free energy over KT. So this free energy landscape, as we call it, allows you to sort of get an idea how the reaction is going to proceed, what are the states where it's going to get stuck. So one prediction is that you're going to spend a lot of time when you are bound just in the four base pairs. So you just fully bound to the toe hole that corresponds to the point with four bonds. This is what you could call a local minima, and then you have to cross a barrier to really finish the strand displacement reaction. And we can also make kinetic predictions so we can tell how far the system is going to move. If you, for example, increase the length of the toe hole, decrease it, if you introduce mismatches, etc. If you are trying to do these things in vitro or in vivo, you have multiple competing reactions. You do want to know what happens if you introduce mismatches and help you design leakless reactions. Again, I'm not, do not have enough time to go into all the applications. I have posted some references to our review papers on this down here, just to tell you that basically we can get insight into how these reactions work and help design new gates. We are also making the case that these reactions, even though they have been first described and studied in the biology community, we argue they are also highly relevant for bio biological systems, even though people studying RNA biology do not call them strand displacement. 
if you look at the data, for example, CRISPR-Cas9 action when editing gene, and when people look at the sensitivity of mismatches, we can make the prediction that if you have the mismatch between the invader strand and the substrate very early on, it's going to slow down the reaction much more than if you have the mismatch at the end. This is consistent, for example, with what people have observed from CRISPR-Cas9, that you are very likely to target the wrong site if the guide RNA strand is not perfectly matching your DNA, which you are trying to cut towards the end. But if you have mismatch at the very beginning of the region where the Cas9 complex binds, then it's very likely that the Cas9 complex is not going to successfully invade and fall off. There's also increasing evidence that ribose switches switch on and switch off using strand displacement reaction. And we are also working with some of our colleagues in RNA biology domain to take the insights we learned from biotechnology and actually help explain some RNA phenomena or DNA RNA interaction phenomena in nature. So that was the strand displacement reaction. I still want to show you the other direction in which we are thinking about biotechnology application, which is the biotemplated design. So another thing that nanotechnology or DNA technology in particular allows you is to position with uh, nanometer precision objects in a 3D space. Why would this be interesting? So what you are looking at here is a lattice called tetrastic on the left and cubic diamond lattice on the right. Now, back in the 1990s, some theoretical physicists made calculations that if you were able to make this lattice out of silicon beads, uh, with the cavities in the middle, comparable to the wavelength of visible light, it will basically act as a omnidirectional metamaterial, which is uh, equivalent of semiconductor, but for light. As you can use semiconductors to construct logic gates for computing, that's the basis of all modern CPUs, the hope is that you, if you were able to realize this material, you would be able to use it for optical computing with photons instead of electrons. It would be orders of magnitude faster. The difficulty is to self-assemble or design these blocks so that they really hold this particular shape I'm showing here. So this is just a unit lattice, so you would have to imagine that this crystal would fill in the entire 3D space. So why we don't have optical computers yet? Well, it turns out it's super difficult to manufacture this. So we don't really have a top-down way to just put the silicon beads with nanometer precision into the lattice. So there has been a huge push for the self-assembly community to assemble these type of lattices. If I cite from an article from 2018, it says that the assembly of the colloidal diamond, which is one of the highly coveted lattices I showed on the slide, it is often viewed as the holy grail of the self in the field due to the challenge that it presents, as well as thanks to its potential as a step towards manufacturing of photonic band game materials. So why is it so difficult and what are we trying to do with DNA about it? So since DNA is a material which is relatively cheap to handle and characterize, our goal here is to use DNA as a template that we would use to basically bring silicon beads or other material into the desired 3D shape. So this is the goal. This would be our unit DNA, and we want to self-assemble it. So we would just assume to throw this DNA into the solution, let them freely diffuse around. When the two single-stranded overhangs meet and they are designed to be complementary, they would form a bond. And this would be the target lattice we would want to show. Now I have to take a step back because I spent about 15 minutes of the talk so far telling you about how fast uh, our model is. The truth is that it's still not fast enough to just throw these DNA strands into the box, let them diffuse and see them assemble into the lattice. So we have to course get even further. I can already hear your jokes about serial lookouts in vacuum, but that's indeed what we are doing. You replace the entire 6,000 nucleotides in this DNA nanostructure by just a single spherical shape with these sticky ends. And we say, okay, if these sticky ends correspond to complementary DNA strands, they, they can bind together. This, what I just described to you, is an abstract patchy particle model. And now we can look at the design and we can 
say, okay, each of these guys has six neighbors. So one of the first design you can think of is that each of the stick ends can bind to any other stick end available. This, if you started the simulation from the already assembled lattice, would hold together quite well. But you, we are self-assembling things. So we are starting from disassembled blocks and we need them to diffuse randomly around and bind it to the target shape. Now the simulation, which takes maybe order of 10 hours on a single CPU, simulates how these things diffuse and how they bind. As you are already starting to see, they are not forming the lattice we want. They are self-assembling or I should say misassembling into these lattice or carpet shapes and tubes. So what you are seeing here is, is what we would call in statistical physics an alternative free energy minima or kinetic trap. So that's the main problem which you get if you are designing systems in self-assembly. You might design them so that if you start from the block you want, they will hold the shape. But if you actually try to start from the individual beads, there's something else they can form which you didn't take into account. And that really messes up your assembly. So what we need is a design tool which tells you, this is what I want. This is my lattice. These are the things which get in my way. So I want you to design the interaction between my building blocks in such a way that it can only assemble the thing I want and avoid the thing I do not want. Now it took us a few months with my very talented colleagues to actually come up with an efficient algorithm which can serve the design space and tell you who should interact with whom. I don't want to have enough time to go into the details, but the basic idea here is that we can formulate the design problem. Like I want this lattice to be assembled and I want to avoid these unwanted designs. We can formulate it as a, what is called in computer science, a Boolean satisfiability problem. So we can formulate it as a set of binary variables and clauses. There are highly efficient computer science software tools that can solve these problems in a matter of seconds, even less. So we can very quickly formulate the problem. The software tells us no solution exists that would form the lattice if you have only one particle type. What you need is at least two different particle types, A and B, and this is the interaction matrix. This means that you know the fifth patch on particle A is compatible with the first patch on particle A and so on. And the software guarantees you that this design can form the lattice and is unable to form the competing structure we have identified in the simulation. Then we throw this into simulation and within a few hours, we assemble the perfect lattice. So this was the theoretic analysis part. Of course, the next stage is to actually realize this with experiment. So when I was preparing the talk, I would, and my slide here and say, you know, we are still working on the experiments, but about one month ago, my student actually was finally able to get the first images of the lattice assembly in experiment. It's still early stages of the experimental characterization. We still need to do diffraction experiments, but it seems like our designs are most likely working and we are assembling the right geometry. So this is an example where we went from very abstract model all the way down to Expanded characterization. I'm simplifying a bit the journey, but we were not, we wouldn't be able to design these blocks within having all these simulation multi scale pipeline to realize it. So, uh, in the few minutes left, I have about 10 minutes of this. Is that correct? Anyways, in the remaining time, I will. I will introduce the tools we have developed to be able to realize these systems. So at the center of it is, of course, the DNA simulation model called OxDNA. But it's just a simulation platform where you basically start from the structure and you see the simulation evolve the structure into the future and characterize its mechanical or kinetic properties. But we very quickly trying to assemble these crystals realize that we need like much more sophisticated tool to be also able to design these structures. So the tool we designed for this purpose and which has since its introduction taken on its independent life with over 400 users per month now, is called Oxview. It is aimed to be complementary to the existing design tools in DNA nanotechnology and use them to prepare and analyze the simulations in OxDNA. 
So what I'm showing on this video is a typical design pipeline. Uh, the most often used tool to draw nanostructure is CAD Nano by Sean Douglas from UCSF. And it's a tool which has fairly high learning barrier, I should say, but you know, it's still the most popular one. So you sort of design their things in 2D and you sort of draw, you know, which, which DNA strand will be bound to what other strand. But of course, you know, we live in three-dimensional space, so you would like to see how these structures look in 3D. So our software actually allows you to very quickly import from these designs and with a few clicks here and there, relax them into the actual predicted 3D shape. So this thing actually is running the OxDNA simulation directly in your browser. So we have deployed online servers where we make GPU free available for anyone from the now technology community. They can launch OxView in their browser, they can connect to our server and they can copy the simulation to our server, which runs the simulation every 20 seconds and copies back to your browser, the current state of the system. So in this case, you can basically make some edits to the structure like cut a few bonds or add new binding partner to it, etc. And as it is running, it will be updating the structure inside your window. Of course, these are big systems, so they take some time to simulate. So, you know, you would maybe need to wait a few minutes to actually see the effects of your change take place. But the idea is that you don't really need to have any knowledge of statistical mechanics or computational chemistry to be able to get some direct feedback on how your structure looks like. Maybe, you know, it doesn't correspond to the shape you designed, so you can go back to the drawing board, redesign it, and again, verify it in the simulation. I mean, the video goes on for a few more minutes and shows you how the structure gradually relaxes, but in the interest of time, let me jump to my next slide. So what are the other things we want to use the model for? So one other thing we, of course, are currently missing and trying to build into the model is protein representation so that we can do protein DNA hybrid. Uh, in the current stage, we can represent the protein the model just as an excluded volume. So this is an example of a hybrid protein DNA nanostructure we have experimentalized in a collaboration with our colleague Nick Stefanopoulos at ASU. So we cannot predict interactions between protein and DNA. You can input any protein as a PDB file into the OxView and you can glue it to the DNA nanostructure. So it's, for example, interesting if you are designing nanostructure that should bind to a viral shell protein, etc., so that you just know spatially how to design your nanostructure. But we cannot then over predict where the DNA is going to bind. It is an external parameter which the user has to specify. So if you know that there's like a binding signs to which the DNA strand binds you have to explicitly tell the simulation these two regions are gonna bind together and then it's gonna uh, attach them so it's just a first step towards a model where you would hopefully eventually be able to represent both dna and proteins at sophisticated cross grain level this one was also implemented in the oxview tool uh, so last thing is one example application where we use our model to help our colleagues in the University of Bonn design an ATP powered leaf spring engine. So we have two, uh, basically two DNA blocks, which are linked by a DNA strand. There is a ribosome, which, sorry, polymerase, which walks across the strand. And it basically pushes these two ends together. Once it reaches the stop cooldown, it falls off and goes back to this bottom leg. So it basically is an oscillatory motion. It opens and closes consuming ATP. And you know, our model is unfortunately not at the level yet where we'll be able to simulate entire polymerase action. But we can already use the model to help our colleagues design these leaf spring engines in terms of you know what should be the length of the DNA strand, what should be what are the effects of using different types of secondary structure in the hinge, and how does it affect the rate of opening and closing. Of course, you would eventually want to get to the stage where we can simulate the system and use it to design a directional nano swimmer, for example. And that's also you know, one of the directions in which we are trying to improve the model. 
uh, or our things are published online with examples how to use it, how to automate it, how to do automated scripting to modify the structures, like attach new strands to them, attach boolean particles to them. For the crystal example, we have developed an entire pipeline where you like say, this is my unit of my crystal. I want you to multiply it and position it into a cube three times three times three, and it sets up everything for you inside your browser. And then you can check whether the design you came up with indeed holds the target lattice shape. If not, you can go back to the design board. So this is how we iteratively designed it until we did get the desired pyrochlor self-assembling lattice, for example. We have also started a project called nanobase.org where we encourage everybody in the community to upload their design so that other groups can share them, reuse them and edit them for their purposes. So right now the state of the field is that, you know, every group has their favorite design. They spend maybe years optimizing, which works quite well, but we don't really have easy way to share them, which is why we really encourage people after they publish their paper, please do upload to our server, convert your design to our common file format so that anybody can download it, edit it, run simulations on it and share with the rest of the community so that we can jointly make progress in designing more and more sophisticated nanostructures. And if you want to simulate your nanostructure and don't have access to your own GPU server, you have launched the service of zn.org, where again, without any knowledge of computational chemistry, you can just watch our tutorials. You can upload your design nanostructures freely. You can simulate them. And we have also implemented some automated analysis so currently our group doesn't have the bandwidth to collaborate with everyone who approaches us and asks to help them verify or design their nanostructure or to help them explain their experiments. But the most often questions we get asked, we try to automate this type of analysis in the server. So hopefully at least part of the problems that people have with their structures could be solved automatically on oxygen.org. So I do highly encourage you to use it. And with that, I'm at the end of the talk. I have to acknowledge the people who actually did all the work I presented. So the design of the particle lattice, all the theory framework, which we call assembly design algorithm has been done with my colleagues in Italy, Lorenzo Rigatti, John Russo, Francesco Sciortino, and Flavio Romano. The origin of DNA model was started as a PhD project by Tom Aldrich in the group of R. Louis and John Doy, which I later joined as a PhD student as well. The Leaf Spring engine was done with my colleagues at uh, University of Bonn, Michael Famolok. The experiments on the actual realization of the nanostructures have been done by my student Hao Liu in cooperation with Hao Yan and Nick Stefanopoulos, the result Hariadi at ASU. The actual computational framework of Nanobase, Oxview, and associated analysis tools have been done by Joachim Bolin, Eric Popleton, and Michael Matisse, and Jonah Prozik as well. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you missed any of the links or the references, if you go to my love web page, shootslab.org, you can find the links to all our tutorial software tools and articles introducing these frameworks. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Um, uh, I think you see all the virtual hands clapping. Um, or you should be able to. Thank you. Yeah. It was uh, really, really wonderful. Um, and you have a ton of questions already in the chat. So we're going to race through them, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Yes, please do. Should I okay, stop? cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask people to unmute uh, if they if they can, because then they can provide a little bit more context on them. So we'll start with Pat. You were the first one. And that's just a reminder, if you uh, want to ask questions to in the chat or raise your hand and I'll try to mix uh, mix and match and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So Ted, if you want to start by... Okay, sure. Open. So I really enjoyed your talk because a lot for a lot of times for self-assembly, much of the prior work has been on the direct side. You make some local rules and see what, what you get, right? So it's really great to see that your focus is on the inverse, the design problem. I know what I want, what rules will will get there. My question to you is whether there are any lessons we can we can learn from similar kind of computational design of assembly at sort of macro scale swarms that people have been looking at with little sort of hand sized robots or also to some extent with, uh, you know, with, with nanoparticle design, or is it that the DNA is a completely different domain that we need, 
total, you can't, there's no synergies there. Oh, certainly. There's actually, if you look at what type of grants and proposals I myself and my colleagues write, you like sort of see what is the current state of the field. And nanorobotics is like really the hot topic out there. So a lot of people are taking inspiration from nanoswarms and like these little simple robots that move around and communicate. The issue there is that we do not yet have such a sophisticated control at the nanoscale level. So if you look at some of these uh, swarm nanorobotics, you know, these robots can make fairly complex decisions depending on the state of their neighborhood. We do not currently have such a sophisticated control at the level of DNA nanotech. So we are still at a stage where, you know, the structures are diffusing randomly and they are bind or unbind. Mm -hmm. But certainly it is a big interest of my group to implement some logic gate functions inside the nanostructures and sort of to some extent mimic the DNA nanorobotics. So we actually did get a big grant on exactly this topic. So if there's anyone in the audience really interested on this thing and would like to work with us, please do get in touch. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, next one up, we have Chris Schaffmeister. Hey there. Um, so that um, three-dimensional lattice, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. That three-dimensional lattice that you described, you're trying to make a self-assembly for uh, optical computing. What are the lattice dimensions there? So in the design we have right now, the individual unit has 15 nanometers diameter. So the cavity sizes are order of uh, 50 to 60 nanometers there. Now for optical, optical applications, you would want to get to maybe two to 300 nanometers at least. So we would probably want to increase the cavity size eventually. But at this stage, we are just happy to assemble it at 50 nanometer. Right, that, and that's because you need to match the wavelength of the light that you want to interact with this thing, right? Correct. So if you want to do existing comp optical computing hardware, you usually want to be in infrared or red spectra. So we need to go to maybe 500 nanometers if you want to use existing light. If you want to do it with ultraviolet light, you know, you can go to a few hundred nanometers only. And, and what kind of refractive index differences do you want from the voids to the material? So the what we want is the material should be silicon and the void should be just air. So of course, DNA doesn't provide you this uh, this value. So the next stage there would be that we need to take silicon beads, which we position inside the DNA structures and just use the DNA structures to bring the silicon beads together then we should have the idle refraction index difference. And then we should be able to see the metamaterial effect that it should, should be transparent for certain wavelength and reflective for other, but we are still quite some way out of that to go. Got you, thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, next one, Ben, who I think has, oh no, sorry, Mecca, didn't want to overrun you. Yeah, so when you're assembling the, the lattice, presumably it's in a solution, you've got lots of the, the materials in there. And so you're going to have several different ones seed at the same time, right? When they, when they grow, will they then join with each other correctly? Or do they just stay separate? Or will they join, but they'll have voids in them, stuff like that? Yeah, so actually, they didn't show the experimental slide. But what, what you see when you do the experiments is that you'll have multiple structures nucleating at the same time. And what you then see under the microscope is like a polycrystalline aggregate. So there are different regions which are probably the ideal crystallatis, but they are joined together into an aggregate. So there is not long range order if you go further than a few micrometers. So that's another issue we need to solve is how to basically get as large perfect crystal as possible rather than polycrystalline assembly. Uh, but we are, that's still a problem we are debugging right now. Okay, thumbs up. Um, wonderful. Ben has two questions. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, it, it's Ben Snowden. Sorry for being a bit mysterious and not providing my uh, second name. Um, uh, yeah, so like maybe maybe a bit of a, a dumb question, but 
if you had to try and like go from these regular lattices to like something more irregular or just some like you know highly complex structure that was made up of like hundreds of thousands of nucleotides or whatever like how might you how might you like approach making progress on that does, does like the lattice approach seem like a good starting point at all and then the other question is like um maybe you touched on this a bit already but how easy is it to go from your like DNA lattice, once you've got that working really well, to going to like a crystal made of silicon um, atoms or, or whatever it is. So there was the first question, if I heard you correctly, you know, how do we approach more complex designs, which are bigger and more complicated? So one thing that we see from the design software that we have is the more symmetric structure there is, uh, the, the fewer building blocks you need to assemble it. If the structure is highly asymmetric, then we can actually rigorously prove, you know, there's some minimum number of distinct building blocks that you need to assemble that complex structure in high yield. This can be actually related to what people call designability in biology. So if you look at biological complexes, like multi-protein assemblies, they are usually highly symmetric. And we think that's because, you know, those are the easy solutions to find by just random mutations as well. So there's a trade-off, you know, the more complex thing you need, the more complicated either protocol. So you can design a protocol where you add different pieces at different times, or you have different strength of interactions and you heat it up, then you cool it down and different regions assemble at different temperatures. And there's basically trade-off, you know, in terms of how many different blocks you need or how complicated your protocol needs to be to assemble more and more complex structures. As for the second questions, how do we go from DNA lattices to actually silicon lattices, which can be used in the industry? That's something I would love to have answer to. At this stage, we are still just characterizing, we are actually getting the right lattice that we want. And the next stage would be to get the silicon beads inside the structures and see whether when we assemble them, there's just enough uh, 3D uh, volume filled by them to be able to have the reflective property. So the next stage would then be to get in touch with colleague who produces DNA coated silicon beads and try to attach them inside the origamis and go from there. Cool. Thanks. Uh, okay, wonderful. Um, if that answered the second one too, then maybe we'll go to Swapnil next. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. My question is about uh, running a DNA simulation using a magnesium concentration instead of NaCl sodium chloride concentration. I know you said like it's usually done in 0 0.5 molar of NaCl, but is it possible to run the simulation in presence of magnesium? And if not, like how would we handle uh, this kind of effect of the magnesium? Thank you. Okay, so our simulation is only parameterized in sodium. Uh, if you wanted to do magnesium, so one known effect of magnesium is that, you know, it destabilizes the lattice. If you have very small concentration of magnesium, it makes the duplexes unstable because they repel each other. People have done experiments where they measured how is a duplex of given sequence destabilized in magnesium and how it is destabilized in sodium. So if you have concentration X of magnesium, in terms of just the thermodynamic stability, it behaves the same as X multiplied by 100 concentration in sodium. So the simplest thing we tell people if they want to try to study magnesium is to just multiply their desired concentration by 100 and run in with sodium. That, of course, is not the whole picture because magnesium is a divalent ion, so it can maybe form bridges between the between the backbones of the DNA, even that is controversial and there's not agreement whether this actually happens or not. But my short answer would be multiplied by 100 and run it sodium, but certain effects, more complex multivalent ion effects cannot be captured by this. For DNA nanotech, most of the experiments are done at very high magnesium or sodium concentrations. So to first order of approximation, you can assume that the salt, the electrostatic interactions are screened enough by salt so that you can probably neglect them and just use out the bihacle approximation for sodium. 
but not everybody agrees with me. So handling hydrostatics in models is actually a very difficult task. Good, thank you. Wonderful. Um, so maybe the normal algorithm then is that I will be asking some of the more positive questions. Um, and if anyone here wants me to interrupt, wants to interrupt me, please feel free to go for it. So first one, uh, you know, something that we would always like to know from people is if you could, and I know that people don't like to speculate much, but if you want to give other folks a little bit of an idea of like what could potentially be possible in let's say five years out or something, um, you know, where would you kind of like point people's aspirations to and what could they get excited about? If you think about this, yeah, a little bit more longer term. Uh, if you want to go even more well, than 10 years. <laughs> in five to 10 years. So I think we are just at the moment where DNA nanotech is trans DNA and RNA tech is transitioning into industrial applications. There have been a, quite a few startups that I've seen come up in the past two years. So I think we will start to see first therapeutic applications of these ideas. So one thing will be in diagnostics. So people are probably, there are already like people who have developed successful assays that they can test a bit real concentration of presence of virus, possibly use it for single, single nucleotide mutation presence in mRNA, for like testing some rare mutations, or even using DNA protein complexes to maybe detect some very low concentration of proteins. Now, I know this sounds a little bit like Theranos, but I think now the science is more solid there. So I, I do expect to see some applications toward this direction. Uh, another thing that it allows you to do is to really position things in 3D space very well and multiple of them. So there is already a startup I know about that is trying to use it to develop multiple and vaccines. So one of these nanoparticles that I was showing, I think they actually used the same one I, I showed for the crystal you can just attach different proteins from the virus on it. So you can have six different variants of SARS-CoV-2 or residues from that protein glued on a single DNA origami. And you know you will ex be exposing the immune system to all of them at once. Another direction would possibly be the smart therapeutics. So you know all the drugs which you see today on the market are typically small molecules mostly that you just take a pill or injection and you know it's supposed to bind to a certain protein somewhere. Off-targeting is an issue. Uh, so you want to have something which only, for example, works in certain types of cell. There have been some successful experiments in mice where you only release a cargo which is encapsulated in DNA origami if the cell expresses particle receptor, which is a hallmark of cancer. So I'm not sure whether we will get clinical applications in five years, but we will probably see, you know, people moving into the direction. So maybe in 10 years, you might see some of the smart therapeutics going this way. And in other ways, I, I do expect like the other direction would be the biotemplated materials. So again, positioning carbon nanotubes on a surface, designing these materials so they can have applications in photo detection. So you can have better ways to basically design materials which will be sensitive to all fewer photons and we will be able to detect them more efficiently than current silicon-based detectors and possibly optical computing designs. That's all the possible directions I could see this going. Very cool, pretty concrete. Um, thanks for that. Um, are there any like potential, like, do, like if you had to pinpoint like your challenges perhaps along the way, and that could either be like technical challenges that you know you like, um, where you think you may get stuck, or we really also you know potential risks, things that we need to be aware of, like as we're developing this technology, like on the more longer term. Yeah, so coming from the computer computational side, you know, I keep repeating that the challenge is that we don't really have very good tools to simulate the operations of these designs. It is still mostly driven by experimentalists when you know it's trial and error. If you want to do something very complex, like something which consumes ATP to degrade protein or rip up membrane of bacteria or whatever, this is a machine which you know designing it by trial and error is super difficult. So we need better tools that can simulate long time scales, include protein, carbon nanotubes, gold nanoparticles, and simulate their interactions with the cell. 
I think we need to invest more into tool developments to be able to unlock, you know, more complex designs. Second thing in terms of uh, barriers I expect on the way to in industrial applications. So one of the first thing is for clinical applications, we don't really need to know how these things will behave in humans. At the end of the day, they are injecting foreign DNA into the bloodstream. It can be immunostimulatory. So there are going to be issues with that and how to, you know, whether we want to use nucleotide modifications. You know, we have all seen the success of mRNA vaccines, but, you know, even there, the side effects could be like autoimmune reactions in a few cases. And this is much larger system. So how do we avoid these things happening? How do we get it approved? It's another issue. Another possible issue, if these things are really able to scale up to industrial level applications, we'll be producing lots of DNA, which is going to be injected into patients. So pollution might be an issue, right? I mean, you have lots of foreign DNA floating around. How do you make sure, you know, it only gets expressed where you want it? Of targeting all these things. Okay, that was extremely complete again. Thank you so, so much. Um, I think one final question that I usually try to ask is um, kind of like a, <laughs> a shameless plug moment of like, if people here in this group, and you can tell, I mean, like, uh, I invite you to just check out the chat. People are extremely excited about this presentation. So thanks a lot. Um, and, you know, if people here were excited, which they are, and were interested in helping, you know, your work and your lab's work along, uh, what are like two concrete things, um, you know, that, uh, that you're looking for? So right now we are trying to make the software community driven. There's maybe like four or five of us who are involved in the development in our research groups. But we would really want to turn this into an open source platform structured along like developers working together on GitHub. So anyone who's interested in nanotechnology, like high school student or hobbyist or professional from Silicon Valley and wants to contribute to some code development, you really have like many new features you want to implement in the model and we have time to do at different levels of complexity from some simple user interface improvement, like including gold and particles in the model, for example. So if you think you can contribute in some of the development, feel free to get in touch with us and we can get you involved. All right, any other bits that People could help, like I see lab hiring, are there any other things that we should be aware of? So we, will be, we will be hiring on the nanorobotics project in a few months. So there will be research opportunities on that topic. Okay, wonderful. Then I invite people to check that out uh, from all of us. Uh, I think I can you know, speak for the group of just really thanking you for such an extremely inspiring, concrete uh, presentation. Thanks a lot for joining. And thanks everyone for your great questions. Really, really appreciate it. It was a very interactive session. Um, I'll be in touch with the video soon. Um, and last but not least, a reminder uh, for people here to nominate a uh, future presentation. Uh, you can also nominate other people to join the group um, via the application form. And last but not least, we have Vision Weekend coming up, which is our annual festival uh, across San Francisco uh, and France. And we have many people that are in this call already joining. So if you want to see people in person again, I invite you to use the application form. We're doing final review on subsidized tickets uh, this week. So if you want to join on a free or highly subsidized ticket, uh, then uh, that this uh, this week is the last chance to do so. Okay, we're now at the hour. Thank you so much, Peter. This was really, really uh, thank cool. You. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you for your questions. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.